Aaron Mandel. I'm the Director of Education for the American Wine Society. And today we're going to do a little bit of wine tasting. We have another video where we talked about how to score wines with the American Wine Society uh, scoring sheet. We're not going to be doing any scoring today. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about glassware, talk a little bit about serving temperature, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour a couple of wines that are, should be available everywhere, and we're going to taste those together. I know that a lot of times people look at wine tasting on the web, they hear about the, you know, the swirl, they hear about the uh, tastings, but none of that ever tells you anything about actually tasting the wine and doing it with somebody and how to do it, so that's what we're going to do on this, on this video. So first let's talk about the glassware. <coughs> you know, we make glassware and wine way too complicated. All you really need are clear glasses that have a taper up. Um, you want them to be a little narrower at the top than they are at the bottom. That helps to concentrate the aromas. And you want a narrow rim. If you have a wide rim or a thick rim on the uh, top of the glass, it, sometimes it feels like you're actually chewing on the rim. And you, you, you don't want that. Uh, a lot of people think that they need larger glasses for red wine than they need for white wine. And that's perfectly fine if you want to do that. But really the purpose of these larger glasses is to help aerate the wine. Some red wines need a little bit of time to breathe in order to bring out the wine a little bit. Uh, a larger glass allows more um, contact area for that. It also allows you a larger uh, swirling area. But most red wines that we buy don't really need that breathing time. In fact, with some red wines, breathing can actually hurt them because they're not made to accept that, um, that additional oxidation. So all you really need are really just one glass, if that's all you really want. And as long as it's clear and has that taper and a thin rim, it's going to end up being fine. A, a lot of people talk about getting these very expensive glasses, one for every variety. And you can certainly do that if you want to. But let's face it, there's, there's one major rule with wine glasses, and that's that wine glasses break. Uh, no matter what you do, you're going to break your wine glasses. And if you have a wine glass break, the only thing you should be thinking about is, damn it, now i got to clean that up. You should not be thinking, oh, poor Billy. Um, we're going to have to put his college education off for another year because i got to buy another set of wine glasses. If you're thinking about the cost of replacing a wine glass instead of just the fact that you got to clean it up, you've spent too much for your wine glasses. So keep it simple, uh, keep them clear, and you'll be happy with your wine glasses. Next thing we're going to talk about is serving temperature. Um, and we're going to start with the reds because that seems to be the one that people get wrong the most often. The rule with reds, they say, is always uh, room temperature. But room temperature, when that rule was developed, was in England before the invention of centralized heating. You know, low 60s. It was not St. Louis, Missouri in July. Um, so really what you're talking about when you're talking about room temperature with the red is low 60s. Uh, slight chill on it. If you have it sitting on the counter in your kitchen and it's 75 degrees, pop it in the refrigerator for a few minutes, take the heat off of it. If it's a little warm, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to volatilize the alcohols in the red wine, and that's what you're going to taste primarily. You don't want to do that. You want to taste the wine. So low 60s for the reds. The, the whites, we have a tendency in the United States to serve them way too cold. A lot of times they come straight out of the refrigerator, they're in the mid-30s, and that's way too cold for most whites. Really you want the whites a little bit cooler than the reds, but not dramatically. You really want them into the you know, mid-50s for the most part. Um, that allows you to really get the full aromatics of the white. If it's too cold, what you're doing is you're suppressing all the aromatics. You're not really getting all the aromatics out of the wine. And so it doesn't really smell or taste like very much at all. Uh, if it's a bad wine, that's great. But if it's a good wine, you want those aromatics to come out. So really, 
you know, mid 50s, mid 50s, low 50s maybe, but none of these things where it's uh, close to freezing. Now with the wines that we're going to be tasting today, I selected two wines that should be available everywhere. I've got a unoaked Chardonnay from Toad Hollow. This is a 2016, and I selected the unoaked because what I really want to focus on is going to be the uh, fruit flavors, and I didn't want a wine that was going to really be dominated by the oak flavors. Uh, for the red wine, I picked a diamond label Shiraz from Rosemont, um, and this is the 2017. As you can see, you know, I don't fill up the glasses all the way. You know, you put enough in there so, you know, you have a nice serving. You really want to have you know, four or five ounces of the wine. And you want to have a lot of room to swirl. And you want to be able to swirl it without spraying it all over yourself, which I have done myself a few times. So you want to be able to swirl it. You want to have a lot of room for that. And what that does is it increases the surface area, it adds a little bit of oxygen to the wine, and it helps to uh, bring the aromatics out. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the wine. And the reason that you look at the wine is really just to make sure there's nothing that's easily apparent that's wrong with it. Most of the time, all you're looking for is to see whether there's any browning in the wine. Uh, most wines shouldn't have any browning to them. That can tell you that it's oxidized. Also, the wine should be clear. It shouldn't be hazy. A haze can tell you there's something wrong. Most commercial wines these days, you don't have any problem with hazing. So you look for the clarity. You look to make sure that it's not browning. And a lot of people, when they swirl the wine, they'll look at the tears. Don't do that. Uh, there's no real reason to look at the tears in the wine. Tears tell you two things. One tells you that there's alcohol in the wine. It maybe tells you a little bit about the alcohol, but you already know that there's alcohol in the wine. And two, if it's a dessert wine, sometimes they'll have thicker tears because of the sugar. But if it's a dessert wine, you know that too. So there's nothing in the tears that's going to tell you about the quality of the wine. Uh, really what you're looking for is just to make sure that the wine's in good con condition when you're looking at the appearance. And then when you swirl it, you're going to take a nice smell. And as I've said on the last video, this is not something your dog left you as a gift. So you can take a really big sniff in order to get the uh, aromas out of the wine. And what we're smelling first here is the unoaked Chardonnay from Toad Hollow. And white wines are going to typically have things like apple, pear, uh, peach, may have apricot. You might get some what some people call minerality, and those are things like granite or wet pebbles, and you might get some floral aromas. This particular wine, when you smell it, at least when I do, I get some red apple, I get some peach, there are some floral characteristics, there's a little bit of yogurt, and the yogurt can come from malolactic fermentation. But you're not really picking up any oak in this. Um, and what you can do, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, I'm not smelling all these different things. What you can do is you can take an aroma wheel. Uh, the American Wine Society has one as an attachment to their scoring sheet. They're all over the uh, web, so you can look it up on Google. You can buy a color aroma wheel on Amazon. And those will list a lot of different aromas that will come in wine. And you can smell a wine and say, do I smell this? Do I smell that? And that's really how a lot of people start because nobody starts out being able to lift a wine to their nose and pick out a bunch of aromas. Um, you just don't do that. Most people start out, they lift it up, and like everybody else, they, they say, I, I smell wine. That's how normally people do this. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of practice to be able to pick out different aromas in a wine. When I first started, um, I was really terrible at it. I had my wife blindfold me and hold things up out of the refrigerator, and I couldn't get anything right. She lifted spices up to me, and I couldn't get anything right. Everybody starts that way. It's a matter of training, and if you want to become very good at it, you train a lot. But just to be able to get to the point where you can do this takes a little bit of work. So don't be concerned that you're not doing it, because nobody can when they first start. With respect to the Shiraz, This has some blueberry in it, some blackberry, a little bit of violet. There's a slight uh, cedary character 
Um, maybe a little bit of used oak maybe in this. There's not a lot of new oak. So if you try to pick those out again, you know, with a red wine, you're gonna get things like black fruits and red fruits. You might get a little plum. You might get some uh, oak characteristics. You might get some uh, red flower characteristics like rose or violet. And in either a red or a white, sometimes you'll get oak characteristics. You might get some vanilla. You might get, like I have in the red here, a touch of the cedary characteristic. Sometimes you'll get uh, coffee or chocolate characteristics in a red wine. Sometimes you'll get spice. You might get cinnamon or clove. This one, I'm not getting a lot of spice. I'm mostly just getting fresh fruit aromatics. And when you taste the wine, you don't need to put a lot in your mouth. And you swirl it around a bit because you're trying to make sure that all the different areas of your mouth are covered. And then you're gonna think about, okay, with the wine warming up in my mouth and some more volatile aromas coming up, what am I picking up? Uh, with this, I'm getting a little bit of more melon than I did on the nose. There's more apple, there's peach. The floral characteristics are not as prominent. So the flavors are a little bit different. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about how they taste uh, pebble or they taste forest floor and a red wine. And you're thinking, do these people really know what those taste like? And the answer is that most people don't go around licking rocks or tasting forest floor. There are some that do. I'm not one of them. But the reason that we can say that the wines taste like those things is because most of the things that we consider to be taste are actually aromas that are coming up through the back of the throat into the nasal cavity. If you think about when you were a kid and you'd try to make a friend laugh when they were drinking milk so it would snort out of their nose, well that's basically because the navel cavity and the mouth have a connection in the back. It's why you don't taste things when you have a cold. When we were in school and we learned about the different tastes that you have on your tongue, nobody said that you have a taste receptor for cinnamon or for blackberry. When you're tasting those things, those are actually things, these are actually aromas that are coming up through the back of the throat into the retronasal cavity and that you're actually smelling, but we interpret them as taste because these things are in our mouth. So when we say that we are tasting pebble or forest floor, what we're actually doing is thinking about that as a taste because we're smelling it through this retronasal cavity. Uh, on this one, I'm not getting any of those, but what you're actually doing when you're hearing people talk about tasting that stuff is they're actually smelling it. So yes, we do know what those things smell like, and so we know what they taste like. With respect to this red wine, the Shiraz, Again, swirling it all around. Here, the taste hasn't really changed that much from the aromatics. It's mostly the blackberry, the blueberry, the violet. Not very much oak characteristic at all. It's mostly just the, the fruit flavors. And I'm not really getting any kind of forest floor or mushroom. Uh, and the flavors in this thing are pretty fresh and pretty clearly fruit. We call those primary flavors, primary ar aromas. And those tell you this is a pretty young wine. It doesn't have any indication that the uh, wine flavors have dropped off at all or changed in any way that would be due to aging. So you know it's a young wine. And there's really not much in the way of tannins in this thing. Tannins can make a wine uh, very astringent. In this one, there are some tannins, but they're what we call round. So you're not really picking them up. They're not out there in the mouth making the wine astringent. But you can feel them texturally. They're kind of laying heavy on the tongue. And that just tells you that there's tannins in the wine, but because they're not astringent, they're not really drying you out. Sometimes with something like a Barolo, you'll feel almost like a light dust is all over your mouth. With a Cabernet, you may get um, feelings like the uh, 
there are really large, heavy pieces of tannin in your mouth, and it's really drying your mouth. Uh, you don't get that in this particular wine. This one, it's very, there's big tannins, but they're very round and smooth, and they're not really picking up a lot of it. You're also going to get acid when you're tasting these wines. Wine is a very acidic uh, beverage. And if the wine is balanced like these are, you really don't notice the acid that much. But what you can do is you can take a sip, and then you can tilt your mouth forward and you're gonna feel the water inside your mouth moving forward. And that is because you've got this highly acidic beverage in your mouth and your mouth is trying to correct the pH, so it's flooding your mouth with water. That tells you that these are acidic beverages and that there's a lot of acid in the wine. Even when they're balanced, you can tell what the level of the acid is just by doing that. So after we taste the wine, the next thing that we do is we think about the finish. Because great wines, or good wines, always have a long finish in them. And uh, with these wines, what you'll do is you'll taste them, and you'll start counting in your head how long you can taste the good flavors in the wine. A finish is not made up of things like uh, just the flavor of the acid or a real bitter flavor. It's always the pleasant flavors that you have coming out of the wine. For instance, I tasted this white wine, uh, probably been about a minute now since I had the last taste, and I can still taste the honeydew melon, and I can still taste the apple and the pear, and it's still rather prominent. That's a, that's a long finish. Uh, it's not a very complex wine, but the long finish tells you that's a fairly well-made, decent wine. Uh, if the wine only has a finish of 10 seconds, it's a short finish. Sometimes the flavors are really good, but the finish doesn't last long, and that's always disappointing. Sometimes you'll have a wine that has a finish that lasts you know, 30 seconds. That might be a medium finish. And again, it's only the pleasant flavors that you're looking for. Now with the Shiraz, Okay, we taste that. It hasn't changed at all in the glass, which isn't surprising since we have only had it open for a short period of time. And this flavor is dissipating. It's not a very long finish. It's, this is gonna be one, it's not short, it's lasting long enough, but this is more of a medium finish because after 30 seconds, most of the finish is really done. Doesn't mean that it's a bad wine, having a medium finish. Most wines do only have a medium finish. But it just tells you that, you know, if it's a pleasant finish that you enjoy, it's something that you wish would last a little bit longer. So that is all we're going to be saying about tasting these wines today. If you have any... To learn more about tasting, please attend a meeting of your local American Wine Society chapter. You can go to the AmericanWineSociety.org website and there's information about chapters there. You can contact the American Wine Society and ask about chapter meetings. You can also email the American Wine Society to find out information about your local chapter. Most chapters meet either monthly or every other month. They taste a lot of different wines, lots of different varieties, lots of different regions, and you're allowed to t attend up to three meetings before you have to join the American Wine Society, so you'll have ample opportunity to meet the members in your local area, try different wines, and enjoy the attending the meetings without having to worry about having to make the financial commitment. The financial commitment is not a lot of money. So please attend a meeting, enjoy yourself, and until next time, enjoy your wine. Thank you.